Joe Tilly's Great Canadian Sports Show is brought to you by Air Patrol North. Visit airpatrolnorth.ca. Our guest today, a former NHL head coach and general manager and a Hall of Fame hockey writer, Doug McLean, Scott Morrison, Joe Tilly's Great Canadian Sports Show. Coming up! Our guest today, he hails from Summerside, PEI. He played his junior hockey for the Montreal Junior Canadiens and in Brockville. He played at the University of Prince Edward Island. He coached the University of New Brunswick, assistant coach in the NHL for St. Louis and Washington, head coach in the AHL for Baltimore, a general manager in the AHL with the Adirondack Red Wings, an assistant coach with the Detroit Red Wings, head coach of the Florida Panthers, led them to the Stanley Cup final in 1996, was a Jack Adams Awards finalist. He was a general manager and head coach of the Columbus Blue Jackets, hockey analyst for Rogers Sportsnet, and now an author, ladies and gentlemen, Doug McLean. And from Toronto, over 40 years as a sports writer, former sports editor for the Toronto Sun, author of numerous books, and another one we're talking about today, former president of the Professional Hockey Writers Association, commentator for Hockey Net in Canada, executive producer of Hockey for Sportsnet, a member of the Ontario Sports Hall of Fame, Associated Press North American Award winner, received the Hockey Hall of Fame's Elmer Ferguson Award, Scott Morrison. Scott, Doug, great to have you here, my friends. Why, why does what a, Scott get a pit? Why does Scott's picture show him twenty years younger than mine? That's BS. <laughs> I know it's BS, eh? Yeah, come on, that's Vic's fault, our producer. So you guys yeah, uh, go, recently Vic. collaborate. Yeah, way to go, Vic. You guys recently collaborated on on, on the newly released book, uh, Draft Day: How Hockey Teams Pick Winners or Get Left Behind. First of all, Doug. Why did you decide to write this particular book? And, you know, when Doug's finished, Scotty, feel free at any time to just chime in and, and, and give your two cents for us here. Doug, first of all, you, well, why did you, you decide to write this book? It's funny. I, I never really envisioned doing a book and really had, had no interest in doing one. And, you know, so, you know, I was approached in DEI to do one, and they said, we can get on that. I said, well, what's the deal? I said, you give us $60,000. <laughs> and we'll do a book on you, and then we'll split the profits. I thought, you know, I don't think I'm going to bite for that bite on that one. So, but anyway, Simon and Schuster phoned me and, and mentioned about doing a book, and I said I'm not really interested. They, then they said like we're looking for something around the draft, a bit of a money ball slant, and it kind of intrigued me. And uh, so, you know, the publisher talked to me, and then uh, we talked, and, and then I real. When I realized Scotty was joining the joining up with me, it was uh, it was a natural. You know, we worked together and had a great relationship. So it made it. It actually with Scotty coming on board, it it made it exciting and fun, and we we actually had a pretty good time doing it. And we both so had Scotty, time on, yeah. We both had time on our hands because our contracts yeah. expired <laughs> at Sportsnet at about that time when we first yeah, yeah. began. Yeah, and, and, we needed some was ca- and we needed some cash. We needed <laughs> yeah. a little like cash. Yeah, unlike yeah, your first than- offer, this one paid money. It didn't take money. <laughs> you didn't have to pay $60,000 for this one. Good, good, good. Scotty, aside from the fact you didn't have to pay $60,000 to write this book, uh, what was uh, intriguing you about it? Why did you want to get involved in this project? Well, as Doug mentioned, we'd known each other for years, dating back to when he was he came into the league as an assistant coach. We've had a great relationship, worked together at Sportsnet, so I thought we'd have some laughs with it because there'd be a lot of good stories to tell, and there are uh, a lot of great stories in the book, entertaining in that regard. And uh, you know, I just thought it was an interesting premise, and uh, and that it would uh, you know, books are a lot of work, but uh, to take it on, you have to have fun, you have to believe in in the subject and in this case who you're working with and uh and i'm glad i did it it turned out to be a a a great finished product i think yeah having watched and listened to doug over the years uh, you you definitely have lots to work with and in the book i found out that doug played with the hansen brothers tell us a little bit about that (laughs) well i didn't play with them but i i went to was 
I went to St. Louis Blues training camp, and uh, they their, their farm team, their first farm team was in Salt Lake City, and then they had a team in Columbus and, and Johnstown, and they sent me to Johnstown. And uh, that's the year that Slapshot was made, that based on that year. So I was there through training camp, and and then Brian, Brian Murray had recommended me for a Hockey Canada scholarship when I played against him in the Central League. So I, I remember phoning my wife. She was at Western. I said, hey, uh, honey, this is this is kind of crazy down here. You know, I, I'm not sure I really want to do this. So <laughs> I, I left and, and I went to the GM. First of all, I was out to dinner with a guy by the name of Reg Kent, who was a veteran there. And I said, you know, I'm pretty excited. Detroit or uh, St. Louis sent me here, and you know I'm really excited. He yeah. looked at me, and said, "Hey, kid, Detroit <laughs> sent me here nine years ago, and I've never heard another word from them. If you if you can get out of here, if you can get out of here, you run." So then I went. Then I went to the GM. His name was John Mitchell, who's a legend in the East Coast League. And I said, "What do you think?" And he said, "If you're my son, and after watching you in training camp, I'd go back to the university." So I went. Yeah. But that was fine. And, and years later, when, in our first year in Columbus, and I told the story in the book, how Clark, my son, and I are driving around Columbus on the 270, and Dave Hansen's being interviewed. He said, well, your general manager here could have been in the movie too, but he wasn't good enough looking. <laughs> Clark looked at me. Clark looked at me and said, Dad, you could have been in Slapshot like it was the greatest <laughs> thing ever. So, I, anyway, Dave, uh, Dave gave me a little plug there. I appreciate it. It really put me on a real like wall of fame, you know. Well, so. that is probably the greatest sports movie ever made, no doubt about that. Oh, so you end up play, yeah. playing at UPEI, and then you're coaching in New Brunswick. And at that time, you said this was your dream job. Uh, obviously, the dream changed a little bit. Oh my God! It, it was my. It really was my dream job. I had been assistant coach at the London Knights the year before when I when I was doing my <clears> masters at Western. And I got the UMD job because of my experience in London. <clears throat> Don Boyd, the coach in London, recommended me for the job. And I had worked hockey schools at UMD. So it really was. We moved to Fredericton. I remember going out to dinner saying, oh, my God, this is, this, this is why I went back to do a master's so I could be eligible to apply for a, a college job. I coached junior in Summerside for the previous four years with the Summerside Capitals. And Jill was in the process of opening a clothing store. And we we're going to have this great life. And all yeah. of a sudden, I get a call from Jacques Bertin. And it totally screwed up our lives. So <laughs> uh, as I said to somebody recently, uh, Jill and I are living in our 29th house since we've been <laughs> married. And that's not because, you know, we moved a lot every year. But I we moved to a city. We'd rent the first year. We'd buy the second year and I'd get fired the third year. So, you know, it was just a merry-go-round, but we had fun. So, Well, you had a couple of great connections with Jacques Martin and, and Brian Murray, and that landed you a job eventually in, in, uh, GM, uh, in Detroit. Uh, tell us about that, that experience. Well, Brian really was the guy. You know, Jacques gave me my first chance in St. Louis as an assistant. And I had a history with Jacques working hockey schools in Brockville and Ottawa around when I was, you know, when I was a young guy playing and when I went to college, I used to go back and, and work with Jock every summer. So that was, that was a big break that Jock gave me. And, uh, but Brian Murray made my career. I, I coached or played against Brian. When I was playing in Brockville, Brian was the coach in Pembroke and then later in Rockland. And he had recommended me for a Hockey Canada scholarship. And I kept running into him. I, when I got the UNB job, I'd run into him at the draft. And then when I got the job at St. Louis, I'd run into him. We'd always talk back about our days in junior when I was playing and he was coaching. And when, when I got fired in St. Louis, he phoned me and offered me a job in Washington. And it was the biggest break in my career. Like Brian, Brian Murray made my career. But without a doubt, he's, he's the number one reason I got to spend 24 years in the NHL. No doubt. So in Detroit, uh, you made a deal to land Chris Draper. And I want to ask you about that particular deal because, uh, you know, you went over in the book, but I, uh, it's a fascinating story. And uh, you, you got a lot of bang for your buck. <laughs> yeah, that was, a, that was a pretty special deal. And, and how it happened was 
Jim Clark, who was a, is a scout with the Ottawa Senators at this time, was was a, was a lifelong friend of mine. Jim and I grew up in the same block. We met in second grade, and he was doing some part time scouting for us when I was in Detroit. And he phoned me and he said, "Hey, this Draper kid in uh, Moncton, Winnipeg's uh, third round pick. He's he's a player. He's got a chance to be a player, Doug, and they don't seem to like him." So I phoned Mike Smith and I said, "Hey, you know, wondering about Chris Draper." He said, you know, John doesn't like him. John Paddock, the coach, doesn't really like him. I love the kid. I really like to see him get a, get a chance. So, yeah, we would move we would move him to you. And I said, well, and, and he just said, I'll give him to you. And then the NHL, you know, put up a stink. So we had to put in a, a deal. So we made it a, a, a dollar, uh, an acquisition for a dollar. And, I mean, the rest is history. Like, this guy... 1300 plus games stanley cups just a wonderful career so it was a cool story and uh it was jimmy clark who who really was the guy that pushed him to me and and then uh we sent him that around that he was unbelievable at christmas he'd come up and he never looked back he's had a wonderful career i mean it's just amazing and and to think he's an assistant gm with the red wings today a great story. scotty any any one dollar players that stick out in your mind that might might compare it to Chris Draper? No, it is an amazing amazing story though. And as Doug said, now he's an assistant general manager and uh, a great guy on top of everything else. And and I guess it was really what put it over the top is I think Scotty was coaching at the time and uh, and he loved him. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah, Scotty, Scotty had an eye for talent. Scotty yeah. came to. Uh, Chris was leading Columbus. I that summer I signed, I signed uh, Chris Draper, and I signed Timmy Taylor for Adirondack. Another kid, but Peterson kid from uh, from the West who was a big time scorer. All of a sudden, Adirondack are in first place, and Timmy and Chris Draper were leading the team in scoring. Scotty came with me to Hamilton one week, one night when he was coaching. And Scotty was tough. Oh, man, he was tough. But he loved Drapes, and he loved Timmy Taylor. And both of them ended up making the Red Wings, having great careers. And uh, I had had Timmy Taylor in Baltimore as a rookie when I coached Baltimore in the American League. And Timmy come up to me in the stands one at a, at a Natarondack game. They were playing Hamilton. He said, Doug, Hamilton aren't going to re-sign me. And, uh, you know, I'd like to keep playing. He was like 22 at the time. And I said, Timmy, I will sign you this summer. You just put that in the bank. I'll sign you this summer. So I signed him, and he was desperate. And the guy goes on to have an amazing career, captain of Tampa Bay, Stanley Cup winner. So it was kind of it was kind of a cool summer for Adirondack. And Scotty loved both of them and gave them opportunities. And uh, uh, be they became really important players on the Red Wings. Okay, so let's talk about let, let's talk about landing the job in Florida. How did you how did you get that particular job and uh, and 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 the run that happened as a result of that in 1996? Well, obviously, I'd worked with Brian for a long time in Washington and then in Detroit, and probably eight or nine years we were together. And he, you know, he fired Roger Nielsen, and we met. He was, you know. I was the associate coach in Detroit and I was assistant GM. And when the job opened up, we went and met and Brian was trying to get out of it because he, he knew I wanted the job really bad and he had to sell it to Bill Torrey and to Wayne Isaac. And Brian, I don't think really wanted to sell. So we went to Bob's big boy in, in Detroit and had breakfast. And I looked at him and square in the eyes and said, Brian, I'm telling you, You'll be an idiot if you don't give me a chance for this job. You will be an idiot. <laughs> and he looked at me. <laughs> and he went back, and it was a, probably a month where he had to sell Wayne. He had to sell Tory. I interviewed with Tory in, in the draft in Edmonton and thought it went pretty well. And, and then I'll never forget, I was at a hockey school, and I got the call saying, uh, yeah, Wayne signed off on it, and Bill signed off on it, and I'm offering you the job. And, I almost drove off the road coming back from taking my kid to hockey school. It was a dream come true. There was a lot of big names that summer, and I, I told him about the book. Larry Robinson was a big name. People wanted to hire them. But the funny thing is, I get the job in Florida. I go in the office, and Pat Riley was just named head coach of the Miami. I thought, oh, 
And yep. the marketing people were saying, how do we market this guy? Nobody has ever heard of him. <laughs> you know, and they got Pat Riley. You know? So anyway, I we we had a great year. The players were terrific, character plus. And, and Pat Riley actually told me to get tickets for the finals. So, you know, it, what comes around goes around. But anyway, we had a great year. And it was, it was, it was such a reward. It, it just was a, that you never forget a year like that when you're a coach and you go to the Stanley Cup Finals with a third year team. It was really special, you know. Hey, Scotty, so in retrospect, uh, you think the, the Panthers did a good job of uh, choosing their coach, the guy who <laughs> takes him to the Stanley Cup Final like that, uh, and two, two all star uh, coaching a job. So that's not bad. Well, it's, it, it was a great job. There's no question about it. And, and credit to you know, that management group in Florida for to get to a final in the third year. The expansion rules are much different than they are today where we saw Vegas and Seattle come in and, uh -huh. and have a, a running start as opposed to what uh, what those teams back in the day had to deal with in terms of what the available talent was. So it truly was an amazing story uh, for them to get to the final. Yeah, hey, uh, Doug, so, so from after Florida, you know, what, what have you done for me lately? A, a couple of years later, you have a slow start and away you go. And then, uh, but then the uh, opportunity comes up in Columbus and, uh, and it seemed like, uh, while well, you became GM and president, the president part seemed to come out of nowhere. How did that, how, tell us about that particular story. Well, Mr. Mack, Mr. Mack, uh, John H. McConnell was a new owner in the league. Uh, he lived in, I, I was, you know, we were living in Florida, obviously. And, and, uh, I had, got his name from uh, an acquaintance and I told the book story, you know, the story in the book, how he had met this guy in Baltimore. Years later, he asked if I would uh, get him down by the Red Wings dressing room. And I got him down with some clients. And when uh, out of the blue, out of the blue, I get a word through Jeff Rimmer that this guy works for the owner of the new team and he wanted to recommend me. So I phoned Mr. McConnell at, at his office at Worthen Ministries. And I said, Hey, I, you know, I'd like to apply for your your GM's job. And I said, you probably don't know me, but Doug McClain. He said, I know you. You were just fired in Florida. So that was how it started. And then I went to his house. I went to his country club and met with him a couple of days later in, uh, in, in Gulfstream here in Florida, just near my place. So it was unbelievable how we just hit it off, chemistry. And, you know, his son was my age and it was just everything seemed to come together. And I ended up getting a job a month later. And it was, it was, hey, listen, very few people get to start an NHL expansion. And it was a tough, tough job in a, in a non-traditional hockey market where Ohio State rules the land. And it was challenging. But, you know, we, we spent 11 years in Columbus as a family and we really enjoyed it. And it was I wish we would have had more success on the ice, but it was a great, great experience. And to be the first employee of a of a National Hockey League team, and when I left, we had 250 people working for us and a thousand people on game nights, and we built the building and the practice facility. You know, it was a it was a wonderful experience. You know, it really was. Yeah, you were the Paul Beeston of the Blue Jackets, right? Yeah. So, uh, that, yeah, not quite from, from the, the ground up. No, quite the same yeah. record. Yeah. No, not 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 yet. It, it's a work in progress, right? But you're talking about being uh, like what the what the Kraken got, what the Vegas Golden Knights got. Uh, uh, Scotty, tell us the difference between what uh, Doug would have been working with back then compared to what uh, what the NHL expansion teams uh, get now. Well, I don't remember the rules precisely, but uh, Doug can probably fill in there. But th just the level of uh, talent available just wasn't at the same at the same level because uh, they've changed, evolved the rules the NHL has as times marched on and the price of the franchises has gone up. And I'm sure these new owners went, said to Gary Bettman, okay, we'll give you 500 million, but we're not coming in and going to be a bottom feeder for 10 years. We want to have a fighting chance. And they had smart management with those rules. George McPhee and Kelly McCrimmon in Vegas did a great job of, uh, of manipulating uh, the team, scaring them about the, the players that they would – they were going to take off their roster because they had to expose so many more players uh, than they would have had to in, in, in time when Doug was starting the Blue Jackets. So 
you know, the rules were different, but the also smart, smart management on the part of Vegas and Seattle to, uh, to get good talent and teams smartened up after the Vegas experience by the time Ronnie mm-hmm. Francis was doing the drafting with Seattle. Right. Yeah. yeah. And the, the biggest, the biggest challenge really was the fact that Nashville came in, Atlanta came in, and then us in Minnesota came in over a three or four year period. It, it was, you know, to have four expansion teams come in over a three year period, it just thinned everything out. And we went into the expansion na- uh, draft, Doug Reisberg and myself, and 90% of our picks were picking unrestricted free agents. Like, for instance, the Islanders leave Snyder available, you know, as their player. Well, he's an unrestricted free agent. So you take Snyder. No one, well, we're never going to get him signed, but, you know, you, you, you just make the pick to get by that pick. And I'll never forget Bill Daly, phone and Riser and I halfway through the expansion draft and wanted to talk to us saying, hey, you're making a mockery of this, you know, this expansion draft. And I said to him, no, no, you guys made a mockery of it with your rules. So, you know, let's, let's, let's call a spade a spade. But anyway, it, you know what? It, you went through the expansion draft and you hoped to have, you know, we got some decent players. We ended up with Tyler Wright, Kevin Adams, you know, different guys like that. But really, it was it was pretty thin and it was frustrating. But and and the your owners don't get that. I mean, Mr. McConnell thought we should we we we, we had seventy one points our first year in the league. Last year they had sixty eight. You know, I mean it it was tough right. sled, you know. Right. But anyway. Yeah, no Mark Andre Fleury available for you. That's for sure. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, yeah. So after after the uh, after the Columbus gig ended, you're you're now uh, working in in broad, the broadcasting business. And, and Scotty, you were working with Mac as well back in the day. Here's a sample of uh, you two together on Hockey Central. Interestingly enough, after it was announced that Vegas was getting a, a franchise, let's listen to that, Vic. Yeah, it was pretty clear from the commissioner's comments afterwards, uh, after the governor's meeting, that the belief is from the NHL that this expansion draft is the best ever and uh, designed to make this team the most successful the quickest if they make the right choices, obviously. So, yeah, th- I think that is very much the NHL's intention to make sure that this team succeeds, and, and we'll see. I, the part of it, not surprised that they've gone to Vegas, the part of it that surprises me is I still can't get my head wrapped around five hundred million. First of so all, Doug, do you have your application in yet? So for, <laughs> no, for, for a maybe that's why it's the last show to pay five hundred million yeah. for a franchise. I don't know how in in that market and in most markets you can ever make it work financially. I, I don't get it. I don't get where the dollars are going to come from. Okay, in retrospect, Doug, uh, you, 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 things worked out okay. I mean, uh, they seem to be uh, doing okay in Vegas these days, right? Well, you know, the bottom line was um, the reason it worked is because they won. And, you know, it took off. And if they would have been a bottom feeder in the league, um, you know, it would have been like Atlanta or like us, even Minnesota. It, it would have been tough sledding there with that, with that market. But the fact they went in, and you go to the Stanley Cup final in your first year, who would ever believe it? And you know what? Full marks. They did a heck of a job. From a marketing perspective, they were so far ahead of, of where we were. Um, it, it just, it was a great job done by the business operation, by George and the hockey group, by Gerard coaching, Gerard uh, Galland. It, it, was a, it was a fine you know, finely tuned machine. And uh, really, my owner paid $80 million for our team in Columbus. And in our first year, we had a $17 million payroll. And we played Detroit eight times, and they had a $77 million payroll. Uh, and I'm thinking, like, does this make sense? You know? And Jimmy D and I were laughing about this recently. You know, he said him and Kenny used to laugh about us coming in to play them with our $17 million payroll. The problem was, in our first year in Columbus, with our $17 million payroll, we had a profit of $22 million. And my owner thought, oh, my God, this is unbelievable. I paid $80 million for the team. We made $22 million our first year. 
What he didn't realize is that as the salaries kept going up, the profits started going down. That's what happened. Right. So, but in my in my time in Columbus, we never lost money one year. My last year in Columbus, we made a hundred thousand dollars, and the next three or four years, they lost twenty five million a year. Twenty five million a year they lost because the salaries went up and the revenue stayed the same. Vegas deserved full marks, as does Seattle, and you know Bettman. Bettman went what, 10, 12 years between expansion teams? I mean, but to put four in and yeah. you wonder why they had them? Serious. Yeah. Yeah, is that what you see too, Scotty? That 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 flooding, that the flooding of new teams versus what happened in Vegas? Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> yeah, that that many teams. So what are you talking about? 80, 100 players that have to be distributed around the league. And if teams are losing players, they got to replace them. So uh, you know, the quality is going to be stretched. And that's what happened. And again, because the rules, the expansion rules were so oppressive, it was even more difficult to, for those new teams to have a, uh, have a good roster out of the gate. But, but you know, so it's I, funny. We go, we go in our first year and we have 71 points. We finish ahead of Minnesota in year one. My owner, honest to God, he thought we won the Stanley Cup. He thought we won the Stanley Cup. So I go to the draft, and it's it's in Florida, and we have the eighth pick of the draft. Like, how dumb am I? We have the eighth pick in the friggin' draft, you know, because we had a, a pretty good first year. Like, talk about dumb, you know. I mean, I should have finished last every year, you know. But anyway, that's why. Yeah, I mean. you, you, you uh, talked about was, the tank aspect, right? Yeah. Go ahead. Scott. That was the advice Brian Burke had given. Doug was the key was to finish last for the first five or six years to keep your job, finish last, draft well, and everything would be okay. You yeah, know, and, and he was right in the game. But what's one, was one right thing we, we talked about in the in the book is the, the conundrum for a general manager is you want to win. It's your instinct. It's in your DNA, and you need to win to keep your job. And yet, for a team like in Doug's situation, losing was the better alternative. So you would finish lower and potentially if the, the lottery didn't screw you, uh, get a better draft pick or have a better draft selection. So it's a real, you know, what do we do? We want to win, but we want to lose at the same time. And in their case, in a new market, winning sells tickets. So there's, it's a real tug of war emotionally. How did you, you know, have that? It, it's funny when I went into Columbus um, and we started to sell tickets, I didn't realize this was, was going on. And I, at that time I was president and uh, for us to sell, we had to sell 12,000 season tickets to be approved by the league. That, that was the deal. So I go in and we talk about ticket sales. I said, okay, well, I'll get the tickets going here. We'll sell it. Oh no, no, just a minute. We're have to sell 12,000 season tickets and every one of them, is a seat license in this building. And I said, what? This is a seat license building. I'd never heard of what a seat license was. So all of a sudden in Columbus, I'm trying to sell a $2,500 season ticket or a $5,000 season ticket. And with the seat license, it was actually double that. So we're asking people to pay Twenty five hundred for the season ticket and twenty five hundred for the seat license or five thousand for the season ticket or and five thousand on top of that. And I'm thinking, are you guys kidding me? We have to do this in this market who wasn't really a hockey market to say the least. It was a, a daunting challenge to sell those twelve thousand season tickets. It really was. And we lucked out. We did it, our people did a great job. We filled the building. We had to sell out every game our first two or three years. It was amazing, but to sell those seat licenses was unbelievable. Tell them Doug, what the name was going to be before Blue Jackets came up. Oh God! Yeah, I remember I was coaching the Panther. I was coaching the Panthers, and somebody came in the in our coaching office after, and Lindy and I and Dwayne and Sutter and Brian, and Brian were sitting there. Comes in with this uh, Columbus T-shirt with Woody Woodpecker on the front of it which is Stinger, and I said, tell me that's not going to be their jersey. And I go there, and they give me my business card, and it's got this Stinger on my business card, President G. I said, are you guys serious? I'm not putting that out. 
that was going to be on the front of the jersey, the stinger. And I said, "Come on, we can't do that. We've got to, we've got to come up with a new logo." So we we worked through that whole logo process. But anyway, it was a name the contest, and the second runner up was the Columbus Mad Cows. And I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Syrian. Jeez. So anyway, the, uh, the Blue Jackets, the, and then they turned it into. You know, we have to come up with some gimmick, and they turned it into a, a civil war stuff and all this to, you know, to, to come up with to get away from Woody Woodpecker logo, the singer logo. It was so, anyway. a close second, a close second to Woody Woodpecker was Fred Flintstone, or what? Yeah, I know it's unbelievable. <laughs> anyway, it's, it's we finally got it, the jersey, the logo, and it's it's actually the logo that's basically you know still one of the logos. So it was it was a fun unbelievable experience I, I told the story in my book about my son who was nine at the time going to school and he came home and he said dad dad this isn't gonna work they hate hockey here they love football <laughs> they hate hockey i said clark don't say that around town we gotta make it work man <laughs> yeah go tell your and it's go become, tell your you friends at school columbus, great. Yeah. columbus has become a great hockey town the mcconnell family you know, we started to buy rinks. They bought a rink in Easton, a suburb, and in Dublin, they bought a rink, and then they built a couple of rinks. 700 kids were playing minor hockey when, when we moved to Columbus. And there's, I think 8,000 kids playing minor hockey today in Columbus. Wow. It's become and wow. NHLers, you know, coming out of a, a rally. They were all with the AAA program we started when I was there, and it, it's really become a great little hockey town. Not a great little hockey town, a great hockey town. Really, it has. Well, let's 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 go. Let's talk about your your you know the draft in Columbus. Okay, so uh, you talk about the 2005 draft in in the book. This is video. We have some video of you and the Blue Jackets brain trust uh, that year with the draft in Ottawa. You talked about the war room in the book. Uh, one of your scouts wanted to fight a player that you were interviewing. Talk to tell us a little bit about that as we get ready to show you some of this video. Find a player that we're interviewing. I'm not sure what I'm. What am I missing? Well, you, I think one of your scouts wanted to was was so angry with one of the players you were interviewing that he that he almost got into a fight with. Or he wanted to fight him anyway. I, I can't remember. Do so you remember that, Scotty? Do you remember that? Well, that was Brian Burke. That was Brian Burke telling that story. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, okay, yeah. okay. It was Burke's story. Okay. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. Anyway, I, for some reason, I thought it was you guys, but. Um, so it, it sounds like in 2005, you guys had a real hard time choosing between uh, uh, Gilbert Brule and uh, Anze, Anze Kubato, Kobotar. Uh, and, uh, you know, tell us about the struggle that you were going through, because it sounds like, man, it, it, it could go either way. And, and some of the some of your team wants to go Kopitar, or some of your team wants to go Brule. What was that process like? It was it was a tough one, and, and right in this this conversation, it was actually on tape of Boydy and I talking here, saying Boydy, I said after what I'd gone through with Sheridan, I said how how can we go with the European ahead of the North American kid? And we you know we had them side by side in the draft, but the draft list actually had Kopitar uh, one pick ahead of Bruno, and the only way that's changed is if I change it. You know, and I changed it. I, our staff was really torn. Our Western guys wanted Brule. We'd have brawls in the meetings because yelling matches because the Western uh -huh. guys wanted Brule and the Eastern. Boydy loved Kopitar. I loved Kopitar. I went to the World Championships and watched him there. Met his father and he. And, and you know what? You know where we got, where it went wrong is we were convinced. I was convinced. Montreal were taking Brule. I was 100% convinced. We had Carey Price rated 12th, 22nd on our list. Most teams had Carey Price in the second round. And out of the blue, they pull this flyer and they take Carey Price at five. And I don't know. Geez, what? So that was the decision. And we took Brule. Brule was an unbelievable player. Like people thought he was going to be Steve Eisman. I watched him the next year. We sent him back. And the Memorial Cup, and people were raving about how good he was. He was yeah. going to be a star in the league, and it it, it didn't happen. And uh, it was, uh, you know, there's no doubt the biggest regret of my career 
of not making that selection to take Kopitar. And it was me. I was the one that made the call. And uh, yeah. as Kippy said to me, what do you think that cost you in your career taking the play over Kopitar? I said, ah, probably personally around $30 million. It's probably what it cost me, you know, because I'd probably still be a GM. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, what? Yeah. that's that's the way it is. And it happens. Like, here's my view about the whole thing. I've been ripped for years on this thing especially in Columbus by the idiots reporters there, but with all due respect. But he went 11th in that draft. There was a lot of smart guys after me, including Dale Talent, Brian Murray, Doug Wilson, and on and on Vancouver that didn't take Kopitar, and he went 11th. Well, we all made mistakes, but I never hear their names mentioned. I never hear those other GM. And that's because... Kopitar became a star in Brule and Columbus and blah, 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 blah. Anyway, that's that's right. the way it was. And I I regret it. But you know what? If you look at, and that's what the book showed, you can look at every draft and see that that happened to so many people. Like, I love the Pierre Maguire reference in the book where when I took through, when Montreal took Carey Price, he was on TSN. Pierre, and he went ballistic on Montreal. How could Montreal do this to their fans? They've got UA and this guy and that guy. How could they take the goaltender instead of Brule? And he ripped uh-huh. him. And then three years three years later, I listened to him on the radio in Ottawa, ripping me for taking Brule. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah. hindsight's he, pretty he good. the yeah. smartest guy in the world, Pierre Maguire, is probably not yeah, I don't hear of him anymore. Where is he? You know, Scotty, what do you think at the time? At the time of the draft, when he took Brule, Brule was a good junior. Like, I don't sure it was a draft year, Doug, or the year before. My memory's fading on me here, but uh, you know, the prospects game, he was a star. Mm. Don Cherry was raving about him. He was, you know, yeah. uh, Crosby. Yeah. Draft year because Crosby didn't play in that game because he was injured, right. but he was being compared. He was being touted as the Western Crosby. I mean, he was a yeah. he was a talent. So it wasn't a bad pick at the time, but it just shows you what a crapshoot the draft is. And you know, Doug and I went to the Montreal draft a few years ago, and and we, we write about it in the book. But it was really something that summed up what the draft is all about. Is Marty Saint Louis coaching the Canadians? He gets mm. up the group greet the crowd at that Montreal draft. And he says, finally, 47 years later, I get to a, an NHL draft. <laughs> Here's a Hall of Famer, yeah. Stanley Cup champion, trophy win, multiple trophy winners, and he was never drafted. And he bounced around teams before he finally kicked in and, and found his way. So it, it just shows you just how you can have the great scouting, great analytics, all the rest of it, but there's still luck involved and you're trying to predict the future of young men and you don't know how that's going to go on and off the ice. Yeah, and you know what? It, 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 if you look at some of the others, I, I just want to run down some of the other picks you had. So same draft, third round, 67th overall, Chris Russell, okay? 912 NHL games. That was not a bad pick for a third rounder. Uh, 2008, Cam Atkinson, sixth round, number 157, still playing. Uh, Mark Mathot, sixth round, 168th overall in 2003, 624 NHL games. Uh, Steve Mason picked in the third round. Uh, when you look back, who would you say is is was your kind of your best pick, your favorite pick, and the and the one that you feel like you yeah you know, this is this was my idea. This I'm, I'm I'm responsible for this pick, and it was a good one. You know, I look I look at you know even uh, Adam McQuaid, who was a second round pick and became a real important guy. And, he, he, he was traded after I left. His rights were traded after I left. But the names you listed there, you know, Steve Mason was a third round pick. He was a Calder Trophy winner. He got the Blue Jackets into the playoffs almost single handedly with, with Hitchcock as the coach. They, the thought was a solid guy. Derek Dursett was a seventh round pick. He played in the Stanley Cup. I mean, obviously, Nash is my dream pick. But you know, I'm. All those, we, we had great success later in the draft with a lot of guys. And Boydy, Don Boyd and his staff did a great job later on. But it's, but it's always the first pick that the GM is judged on. It's always the first pick. And Pascal Leclerc was an eighth. We drafted him eighth overall. 
you know, it was a draft where our decision in that draft was Comissary or Pat uh, Leclerc. That's who we thought would be there. Comissary goes a pick ahead of us. We take Leclerc. Leclerc had nine shutouts in the NHL and was a star and hurt his knee and his career, you know, descended from there. So, we, you know what, it, but you're judged on your first round pick. And, and that's, you know, Kessler was, a, was our first pick. He played a thousand, close to a thousand games in the NHL. Twelve years in the NHL was a good pick. Right. But uh, we wanted Gabrick in that draft and we lost the coin toss, you know, and, to Minnesota. Yeah. Gabrick was the guy Boyd he wanted, we all wanted. So it's all over the map, but it, you're judged by your first picks and that's where it hurts, you know. You got to hit, yeah. you got to hit them. You got to hit those. The Jardev draft, our decision was Banning or Jardev. And it wasn't even close with our group. They wanted Jardev. And I'm walking down from the, the stage when I took Jardev. And Darcy Regeer's going up to make his pick. And he said, Hey, you know, we're taking Banning. If you would have taken Banning, we were taking Jardev. Yeah. Oh my God, I wish I would have taken Banning. <laughs> right, right. So it's funny. It's just the way it is. And it's an exciting time. And but I'll tell you what, if you screw up those first picks, you pay a big price. Yeah, another element of the crop suit is Jardim was a great talent, but you don't yeah. you can't predict how that talent is going to be right. off the ice. And it was what his personal life got in the way of his hockey life. So that's just another element of uncertainty to the whole process. Yeah. yeah. Well, one, one player who, who you mentioned and it was, who was class act on and off the ice, uh, recently honored by the Blue Jackets, Rick Nash, and, and you were there. Let's, 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 let's roll that. Uh, Rick. When he walked into the dressing room as an 18 year old, how he, he handled himself so well. And the players respected him immediately. And this was the Luke Richardson and a lot of veterans. And he carried himself like a pro. And as I said tonight, he, he was a better person than he was a hockey player. And that came through loud and clear tonight. But I watched it and I followed him ever since. I mean, he was just a, I was around the NHL for 24 years. And he was my favorite player. And I had some good ones over the years and assistant coach. And he was my, and I get teased in Canada a lot about it because I talk too much about him, you know. So I'm really proud of him. How good was he? You know what? He, he was a special talent. He really was. When you think as, a, as an 18, 19 year old, he won the Rocker Richard Trophy, 40 plus goals, you know. I mean, Kovachuk and again, I think we're tied in that Rocket Richard. That's that's how that's with an expansion team to win the Rocket Richard. And I'll never forget the game in Detroit when he won it. When he when he scored, I think it was the 41st goal and a great assist by Jaredev. And I'm like, oh my God, have I got it made? Have oh. I got it made? Jaredev playing so great, and I got Nash playing so well. I mean, this is going to be unbelievable. And I, you know, I was really proud of him. And you know what? As I said about him, he's been a Columbus kid forever. He, I think he'll be their next GM. I really do. I think he's 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 working in the background now, you know, assistant to the GM and doing getting his hands dirty. I I predict he'll be the Blue Jackets' next GM. They could they couldn't make a better choice. Nick and Rick. Nick and Rick. Yeah. Sure, Dev and uh, yeah, oh my God. And, and, uh, hey, what could have been? Hey? Cover the hockey, oh, yeah. the Rick and Nick show, and I'm thinking, oh my god, I'm, a I'm a genius. I was a genius that day that cover came out. Today I'm a double. <laughs> yeah, it happens. You're a genius with a J. You're a genius with a J. <laughs> <laughs> Write that down. I'm a genius with a capital J. Uh, <laughs> so. Uh, I want to talk you talk you have a chapter on Eric Lindros in the book and I just but before we let you go I want to talk about that uh, the, the Lindros show There's some amazing stuff in there like uh, you as you mentioned Paget made incredible notes and and uh, just looking back at who who was most responsible for the for the Lindros fiasco in your opinion Marcelo um, Marcelo <laughs> right in terms right. of the fiasco being the trade to two teams, it was because Obu 
was working apart from his general manager, who was Pierre Paget, who had everything under control and understood what was the process and what the teams were feeling. And uh, he went out and cut a deal on the side and then turned down the deal that the general manager and the hockey staff wanted. And that was the Philly offer at the time. And so, and he didn't know that Chicago wasn't going to give the $15 million to make the deal. And so it was really Obu who got in the way. And it was Obu was the reason why uh, Lindros didn't want to go to Quebec in the first place. It had nothing to do with language and nothing to do with the city or culture, anything like that. He married a French girl, in fact, and bought property there. Right. You know, I, I love the chapter, and, and we, Scott and I really lucked out because Pierre, Pierre Paget, who we've known, uh, you know, Scott knew Pierre well, and, and Pierre really trusted Scott from his career in, in media. And when we talked to a friend of mine, hooked me up. I knew Pierre, and I was a friend of his. And he agreed uh, when Scott and I called him. He agreed to give us everything. He said, "I've copied. I have every note, every note, and I've kept it, and I've looked at it many times, and I've never given it out." And he agreed to give it to Scott and I. And Scott and I, we were on the call a few times with Pierre in Austria, and. We were shaking our heads at, at the at the deals that were offered for Lindros. And then after the book comes out, I'm doing an interview and, and with a columnist in Toronto, and I, you know, he talks about the trades. And he checks with Serge Savard and uh, and Fletcher, and they deny the deals. They deny. Uh -huh. Well, Pierre uh -huh. was sour. Pierre was sour. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, and, and, and Scotty and I talked right after, and I said, well, I'm going with Pierre. I know he had it written down, and I'm telling you, it was a, it, he was a machine, eh, Scott, going through this stuff to us. It was unbelievable. I love the chapter. Scott did yeah, a good was. job, uh, you know, breaking it down. Because Scott was, Scott, as a writer, was heavily involved in that Lindros saga. saga. He was there on the ground. So Yeah, you know, I mean, I... I covered that that draft and stuck around for the week afterwards. Well, Larry Bertuzzi, the arbitrator, if I tried to figure out uh, which team was going to get him, Rangers or or Philadelphia, and you know, and again, that was a, a ground breaking whole situation. When you know, when he was drafted, it was a no brainer. He was going to be a superstar, and he became a superstar. And it's it's unfortunate because injuries really cut his career short and uh, curtailed how good he could have been. Uh, but in that 1992 draft, when, when the trades came down that morning, but I remember being up on the Friday night before the draft to like two in the morning when my deadline closed and teams were just, and I heard a lot of those names, but never to the magnitude that Pierre shared with us. And, you know, he told the story about how Cliff Fletcher got cold feet and said, all of a sudden looked at what was on the paper and said, I can't do this. And, you know, Cliff was, Cliff was quoted in the in the newspaper article as saying, "If I'd made the deal, I would have had a great player at Lindros and an American Hockey League team around him." But, but that's how good <laughs> it was, and how badly uh, all these teams wanted him to have, to have the names uh, in conversation. Uh, and they did. I mean, it was just amazing the details that he shared, and uh, and nobody is, I don't think, is told the story how that draft warning shook down with the conversation with Billy overnight, uh, Chicago in the morning, and then ultimately the Rangers, how the two trades uh, came to pass. It wasn't uh, that they did it on purpose. It was, again, because Obu kind of ran a, a drift from his general manager. Right. That's crazy. Yeah, did was, they get the best deal? Did they get the best deal, Doug? Yes. Yeah, they got an unbelievable, they, they got an unbelievable deal. And, and, it, and you know what, it's, what he said, you know, that, the joke, what Pierre said is, people are saying, well, Forsberg this and Forsberg that. Pierre said it wasn't even close at the time. But Forsberg gained 20 pounds, threw a couple of inches, and that became the story. But I love this quote when he said, people talked about Gretzky to Lindros. He said, he was, Lindros was a six foot five. Gordy Howe. That's mm. what the description of Pierre, what Pierre's description of him was, and and he was pretty accurate. I mean, I coached against him in his prime on the with the Legion of Doom with Leclerc and Renberg in the Panther series against 
against uh, the Panthers and, and Philly, he was a beast. He was a beast to coach against and punishing. And on top of his game, we beat him in six games in that series. But I'm telling you, he was something else to coach against, how good he was and how talented he was. And he should have had just an amazing career, but concussions really derailed him. Yeah, he was special yeah. talent, no doubt about that. There was. Yeah. Um, see, okay, before I let you go, Doug, I a question I like to ask all my guests. Uh, uh, it's got some feedback happening there. So is that just me or is you guys hearing that too? Yeah. Okay, anyway, you're good. hearing it? Okay. Um, don't know where it's coming from, Vic, our, our trusty producer, see if he can deal with that. Anyway, okay, so Doug, what, what is the best uh, best advice you've ever received? Best advice I've ever received. <laughs> I don't know. I've gotten a lot of advice. I've gotten a lot of advice. <laughs> or given out. You know what? I, I think I, I think you know, you know, I often think back to my parents and you know, uh, don't forget uh, don't forget where you're where you came from and uh, and treat people uh, with respect and uh, you know things will Things will typically work out. And uh, I think back to growing up in PEI and my lifelong friends uh, who ended up being with me in Columbus, five of them. Uh, wow. you know, uh, it was, it was uh, being from PEI was pretty special. And I think it was really, it really stamped who I am. Right. You know, what's good too, is I like, I like the way you complimented Neil Smith on his pick of Kyle at Closo. Yeah, yeah. Walking by the draft table. <laughs> very nice, very nice. Yeah, it's, yeah, it was kind of funny. Not, and Neil and I actually played junior together in Brockville. We were teammates with the Brockville Braves. How bizarre is that? And after a right. game one night, Neil says, you got to come to Tim Horns with me. i got a, a friend of mine who's a scout wants to meet you. So I go to the Tims in Brockville, and all of a sudden, Jimmy Devilano sitting at the table with Neil Smith. And that was the first time I met Jimmy D and, and Neil was teammates and Jimmy D and Neil were lifelong friends, you know? So it's kind of funny how it goes around. What comes around goes around, you know? Pretty awesome. Scotty, same question. What's the best advice you've ever received? Well, I think from a, a media perspective, it was, uh, you want to get the story first, but first you want to get the story right. And that's the thing I've tried to live by in my media career over 40 plus years. Oh uh, yeah, so important, eh? Check it out. If you're when in doubt, check it out. Well, once again, and you've done a good job of that, my friend. So the book is called Draft Day: New Hockey Team, or sorry, How Hockey Teams Pick Winners or Get Left Behind. Great read. Some fascinating behind-the-scenes stuff. It, it, it's going to blow you away. And of course, I love the uh, Eric Lindros chapter. It was uh, phenomenal. The whole book, though, it's great. Thank, congratulations on the book, guys, and good luck with it the rest of the way. Thanks for being here. Thanks a lot. Appreciate the support, man. All right. More sports when we come back. Thanks, guys. What our kids breathe matters more than ever. But how can you tell if a school is safe to breathe in? If you could actually see what's in the air, would you keep them home? Introducing Air Patrol. Making the invisible visible. Ensuring schools are safer for everyone. Breathe safely. Addiction Rehab Toronto, Toronto's number one alcohol and drug treatment center. Saving lives, reuniting families. The only treatment center in the province to offer medical detox, treatment, sober living, and lifetime aftercare all in one place. Our unique and specialized programs are designed to equip our clients with the tools to successfully lead a life of dignity, respect, and purpose. Let us help save your life or your loved one's life. Call today for more information or to facilitate an intervention. 1-855-787-2424 or visit addictionrehabtoronto.ca. MNP a leading Canadian national accounting, tax, and business accounting firm. MNP proudly serves and responds to the need of their clients in the private, public, and nonprofit sectors. Through partner-led engagements, MNP provides a collaborative, cost-effective approach to do business and personal strategies 
to help people and organizations to succeed across the country and around the world. With local offices in Oshawa, Mississauga, Burlington, and more, their team is here to support you. Visit mnp.ca today to learn more. And we want to thank all the folks who make this show possible. These are friends, trusted business associates, and all-around great people. We highly recommend them all. Thank you for your support of Canadian sports. A reminder that the show is available on iTunes, Spotify, Breaker, Radio Public, Google Podcasts, and Pocket Cast, as well as the Spanglish Network, Buzz TV Live, and Zingo TV. Also, check out the show on YouTube. All of our past great shows and clips are on there, some shorts, lots of, lots of stuff to look at. Like and subscribe. It is absolutely free. Thanks once again to Doug McLean and Scott Morrison for being on the show. Thank you for watching. We'll see you next time. Brian Gribben Insurance Planning, helping you solidify your financial future. At BGIP, what we do that's unique in the marketplace is we show people how to spend and enjoy their money in their early years of retirement without the fear of running out. Also, we're able to do this without you having to change financial advisors. Please look us up at bgip.ca today. Let's book a 30-minute phone call to see how we can bring value to you and your family in your planning. Call Brian today for all your retirement needs. We did. 905-686-5678. Air quality at work matters more than ever but there's no way to tell if the space is safe to breathe in. If you could actually see what's in the air, would you even come to work? Introducing Air Patrol, making the invisible visible, ensuring workplaces are safer for everyone. Breathe safely. Rooted in 60 years of tradition, Sleepy Hollow is a private golf club with a friendly community of members just minutes from Toronto. With mature trees and rolling fairways, Sleepy Hollow provides a challenging and enjoyable experience for passionate golfers. Enjoy great golf, amazing dining, and a picturesque patio second to none. Visit SleepyHollowCountryClub.com. Hi there, I'm Joe Tilly. Are you ready for an adventure of a lifetime? Next March, during the enchanting cherry blossom season, join me and my wife for an unforgettable two-week journey to Japan and South Korea. In Japan, you'll experience the magic of the season as we visit the stunning Osaka Castle against the backdrop of cherry blossoms. Feed the adorable Sika deer at Nara Park, glide through picturesque landscapes on the famed bullet train, Cruise on Lake Kawaguchi and witness the awe-inspiring view of Mount Fuji. Relax in natural hot springs and savor a delightful Fuji dinner banquet while dressing in traditional robes. And of course, we'll dive into Tokyo's cutting-edge technology scene. In Korea, dress in elegant hanbok attire and step back in time at Changdok Gong Palace. Wander through Andong Village, a true glimpse into Korea's rich heritage. Delight your taste buds with the flavors of Korean barbecue. We'll even visit the DMZ area to get a glimpse of mysterious North Korea. And guess what? This incredible journey is all yours for just $54.99, all inclusive with direct flights from Vancouver or $58.99 from Toronto. Book now to unlock up to an extra $1,700 in upgrades and savings. Let's make some memories. Let's explore. Let's travel. Guests on Joe Tilly Sports receive a gift certificate from Classica Imports. Top of the line, imported men's clothing. Check out the Classica Essential Collection now. Go to shopclassica.com.